I've been saying this since day one. Learning to write assembly is one of the easiest ways to get better at programming, to learn how computers work at a low level and write better and safer code. And the best part is learning to code in assembly makes you feel like a wizard. The problem is that assembly is hard to learn. And for a lot of assembly variants, there aren't a lot of good resources out on the internet that teach you how to learn them quickly. Now, whether you're a student, a senior dev, a pen tester, or just somebody who likes to tinker around with code, the technique I'm about to teach you is going to save you tons of time. Honestly, when I was a student trying to learn assembly, I wish someone had taught me like this back then. This would have saved me hours. My technique is called the assembly Rosetta Stone. It's a bit of C code that if you compile it, and view it in the assembly that you're trying to learn, you can learn all of the basics, everything from what the registers are called, how wide they are, how the stack is used, the calling convention of that architecture, and a bunch of other really important things. In this video, we're going to use the Rosetta Stone of assembly to reteach myself ARM 64-bit architecture. Now, I want to highlight, I'm not the first one to come up with this idea. Here is the author Tim Ferriss's blog, and he has an article called How to Learn But Not Master Any Language in One Hour. He essentially says that any language can be broken down into a series of sentences that if you can learn to speak those sentences in the language, you will be able to understand the grammatical structure of the language entirely. So in this example today, you can think of all these different clauses in C as sentences. Knowing how these sentences work in C and then learning how they work in assembly is the fast track to learning the new assembly variant. Now, when we start learning any assembly language, we need to learn the basics of the registers. What are the variables in the CPU, the hyper fast memory that contain the data that we're moving around? So let's get into the Rosetta Stone and see how we're going to learn that. I've created three separate values. This is 64 bits long, this is 32 bits long, and this is also 32 bits long. I want to see what registers do they get stored in in the assembly and how do they get put onto the stack. So with the Rosetta Stone compiled into our target architecture, ARM64, we can then object dump it and then look for our main function to get our feet dirty. So here we see Babe Cafe Food Face and a couple other Sentinel values appearing in the assembly. It loads the Babe Cafe food face in reverse order into what looks like the X0 register. Let's write that down and take that for note. I made a weird X. I apologize. Babe Cafe food face and put it into X0 in four different parts. And then we run this other operation called store where we move X0 into what looks like SP comma, so probably plus 56. What have we just done? We actually learned two very important assembly ideas in ARM64 in just a matter of seconds. We learned not only that X0 is a 64-bit register, we also learned how store operations work to store values onto the stack. So now we know that our Babe Cafe food face value lives at position 56 on the stack. We'll take that down for note as well. So we did learn about the 64-bit value, but what about this 32-bit value? How does that differ? We see our dead food value, a 32-bit value, get moved into not X0, but W0, what does that tell us about the architecture? It's actually very common in architectures that have multiple width registers to contain them within each other. You have the larger one, X0, that is the 64-bit variant, and then inside of that, the lower half is now your W0, which is 32. This is the same for Intel, too, where Intel has the RAX, which contains the EAX, which contains the AX, which is just a concatenation of AL and AH. I have that backwards, AH and AL. But you see the idea. So here we have now learned not only the names of the registers, it's X0 through whatever the max value is, but also that there are two sets of registers that are different sizes, awesome. So we learned the names and the width of the registers and then how they get used. Next, we're going to go into the calling conventions. Fish break. So what is a calling convention? This is a, a fundamental piece of computer science and computer engineering. If you have two functions, let's say function A, call it func A, and we have func B. And we have function A, call func B. Function A and function B need to agree upon between each other where the arguments go for that function call and also where the return value goes for that function call. Also, they need to agree upon who is in charge of cleaning up the stack. Is it the caller or the callee? That set of agreements, that, that convention that they all adhere to is what is known as the calling convention. And for you to be able to code in any assembly variant, you need to know the calling convention that is used by default in that architecture. So let's go learn the ARC64 
calling convention right now using our magical C code. So what I've done here is I made a function called returnyfunc that takes a series of values that we can use to identify the calling convention. Before we do this though, we need to figure out where our value i lives so we know how the reference is made in assembly. So this value here, 1337, is actually 539 in hex. So just so you know, that's how it's going to appear in the object dump. Using our sentinel value 539, we see that 539 gets put into W0, and then W0 gets put into stack location 44. So let's write that down. Our variable i lives at location 44. And then note, this is decimal too. This will probably confuse you here in a second. So again, we're looking for the setup for returny func. So we've just learned actually a few things by just looking at this piece of code. First of all, we learned that the BL instruction, which is most likely going to be branch and link, is how the computer is doing the function call. It's gonna be branching to returny func and then putting into likely a link register the address that it has to go back to. That's part number one. Part number two is we are seeing it set up the function call by putting the address of our variable i into a particular register. Again, don't forget, in our returny func function call, we take the address of i and then some other magic values. And don't forget, i lives at position 44 on the stack. So here it's putting into x0 the address of sp plus 2c, which for some reason they mixed hex and assembly, but you'll see that 2c is 44. So this is actually the address of i going into x0. Awesome. Okay, so we see that x0 is getting the address of i. You'll see that w1 is getting 42, w2 is getting 69, and then w3 is getting 3, 1 through 3, 7, which are all the values we put into our assembly code. And then we're doing that final branch and link. So we just learned the calling convention of how arc64 passes arguments into function calls to call other functions. That's really important. We need to know that to write functions in arc64 assembly. We got the arguments down. How do we get the return value? Let's check that out. The way we can check out the return value is actually by going to returny func, which is right here. Typically, the last move that we get is going to be the return value. Remember, it takes in a character B and a short C. So it's loading the byte into W1. It's loading the short into W2. And then it's adding those two together and then it's putting that into W0. So now we know that the return value for functions in arc64 goes into W0. That is awesome. And again, by learning the branch and link instruction, we learned that the value for the return address goes into a link register, which is pretty common for all ARM architectures. Okay, so let's go into branching and conditional branches. So to learn that from our C code, I've made this control flow here where I say, int i equals some value while i is not zero subtract from i so let's go into our c and see how that plays out we move 539 into w0 and we store that onto our stack we branch to 74c which is right here we then load the value into w0 and compare that value to zero and then we take a branch not equal to 740 which is our loop again. And then the loop loads that out, subtracts one, stores it back, and then loads it. And then we do that all over again. Okay, so we actually just learned a very valuable piece of information. How do conditional branches work? How do the fundamentals of if statements, for statements, and while statements work in ARC64 assembly? You load a value to a register, you can pair that value to some number, and then you do a conditional branch. So a branch if not equal. And I'm sure there is branch greater than, branch less than, et cetera, that can all be used to do this functionality. What did we just learn? We learned not only branching, we learned conditional branches. And dude, we already learned calls from our previous return statement stuff. So we're almost done learning the majority of Arc64 in a matter of 10 or so minutes. Insane what this can do for you. Finally, the last behemoth we have to tackle is the syscall interface. So all of this code is well and good. We can move data from here to there. We can do loops. We can do function calls, all that stuff. But none of it matters if we can't talk to the kernel. The kernel is ultimately the beast that interfaces with the hardware below us and prints things to the screen, does network calls, file operations, all that stuff. So we are going to figure out how we do a syscall by calling, by going to the syscall function in the architecture. If you remember NRC, what we do is we call a syscall function. Again, we have not actually invoked a syscall yet. This is a C function that wraps the syscall interface of the kernel. We pass the syswrite value, the operation we want to do, into the first argument of our function. So at this point in the code, this lives in x0, x1, 
x2, etc. Remember that for the, the assembly breakdown. So here, after we get to this location, and again, w0 and x0 are interchangeable, one is 32-bit, one is 64-bit, we move w0, the syscall number, into w8, and then eventually invoke service 0, which is the syscall instruction for arc 64. What did we just learn? What we learned is that to do a syscall in 64-bit ARM assembly, we put the syscall number into w8, and then put the rest of the arguments into that register plus one. So if it came from x1, it goes into x0. If it came from x2, it goes into x1. All of these things are how we set up a syscall, and we just learned that in a matter of two or so minutes. Now, okay, remember how I said that this technique will teach you the basics of a language, but just like learning Japanese, for example, this technique may teach you the basic grammatical structure but it's not gonna teach you extreme conversational nuances and things you would use with your family and friends. The prologue and epilogue and arc assembly is kind of like that, and let me show you why. Now, no normally the prologue and epilogue and assembly is extremely simple. In Intel, for example, you do a push, you do a subtract, you're done. Here, it's a little more complicated. Yeah, so, so normally it's not this complicated. But this is an extremely complex ARM instruction that unfortunately this technique won't teach you. There are just going to be some of those techniques, go Google it. But in this case, this is called a store, a pair of registers operation, and it's also a post indexing operation. So what this does is it stores X29 and X30 at the value of SP at the time, and then updates SP minus 80. What that does is it stores the link register at the time, the register that's going to contain the return address and the current base pointer at the time onto the stack. Then from there, it's going to decrement SP minus 80, make room for our variables. Again, fairly complicated, not super important, but I wanted to make sure you guys saw that and recognize that this technique works for certain things, but not all the things. And again, the function epilogue is similarly complicated, it loads two registers from SP plus 80 and then decrements SP 80 and then returns by jumping back to where the link register is. Well guys, that's it. Thanks for watching. Hit that sub button and then go watch one of these videos where I'm sure you'll learn something just as cool. All right, you're still here. Cl click a video, just pick one. It's right there. What are you doing? Okay.